Welcome to One Plus One. To the people around Australia, also welcoming you to the Daly River region. Welcome to know you, Dad. My name is Miriam Rose Ungenmaier Bowman, and I'm from Daly River. I spent most of my life here. I'm not the traditional owner of this land that we're sitting on. It belongs to the Malak Malak people and Matngala. My homeland is on the Moyle River between Palumpa and Pipi Manari. I'm of the Ngangawumiri tribe. And then all the water that dropped off your head is being taken downstream by the current. And then all the ancestors of the land further down are being acknowledged of your presence. It's beautiful living here because of the land that we're connected to, and it means a lot to me. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you for having me. Thank you. Miriam Rose Ungmal Borman, thank you for that welcome to this country and welcome to One Plus One. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, being able to have the privilege of you coming here today to know you. It's where I live, at Daly River, to be part of this program. I'm thrilled that you're a part of it. Now, we are here three hours southwest of Darwin. Mm -hmm. This community uh, where we're sitting right now your community where you live. Tell me about it. I was born and I grew up here on the banks of the Daly upstream on a farm. My dad passed away when I was about four. And um, then his brother, who was a police tracker here at the police station at Daly River, said that he'd take the two oldest ones, so there's my sister was older than me and then myself, and left the smaller ones with my mom. You know, in our way, as Aboriginal people, he's my other dad. I can just automatically call him dad. Yeah, and tell me about that for Australians that aren't <clears throat> familiar with that that, that really, it's an extension of kinship, yes. isn't it? It's, it's that connectivity. Connecting and belonging, that's really important. So, like, if your dad dies, uh, it's not as if you haven't got anybody else. It's a really powerful part it of is. culture, isn't it? And he was married to my mum's sister. So it was just an automatic relationship with them. And that was amazing. Was uh, he got transferred to different stations at various times. You know, hanging around police stations, going to school every day at Adelaide River, Pine Creek, Mataranka. I couldn't wag school. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was lovely. And um, the policeman supported my family um, and was enrolled in the schools. And I'm glad that I had that opportunity that then helped me as I went, oh, when I grew older, working and connecting with Westerners. During this time, your sister Pilawak was, was taken, wasn't she? I wonder if you might share with us what happened to her? Oh, well, she was taken from here to Darwin and sent to Garden Point on the TV Islands and then down south in Adelaide. And as I was growing up, uh, the missionary said that she was adopted and was in Adelaide. And that's all we knew of where she was. Um, the people that adopted her separated, I think, and uh, left her. She sent to another convent school, Cabra, in South Australia, Adelaide. And uh, that's where she was educated and the nuns were very good there and looked out for her. But as she got older, she knew mum 
mom's name and she knew which community she came from. And then she started making arrangements when she was old enough, I think. First time we met her was when she was 16. What, what was it like reconnecting with your sister all those years later? It was very moving, actually. She started making arrangements with um, the missionaries here and saying that she'd like to come back and meet us. It was very moving when she did. Yeah, it was lovely. The children here in this community have got the choice because we are in two worlds. And if they can become strong in themselves by learning about themselves and who they are and all that sort of thing, I think they can then slowly adapt. Miriam Rose, many people will know you through your work in education. Uh, but my understanding is that your teaching career began when you were caught reading while you were working for a teacher <laughs> as a <Stop>. domestic helper. <laughs> I was having a break. Anyways, yeah, she walked in on me when I was reading a paperback. Anyway, she said, uh, oh, can you read? She didn't go crook on me for sitting and reading. <laughs> and then she said, yes, I can. And she said, read me a paragraph. So I read her a paragraph. And she said, right, you can be my assistant teacher. Just like that? Yes. And I said, oh, I'll give it a go. And uh, I don't know what it's all about, but I'm willing to learn. And then I ended up being her assistant teacher. And while I was doing that, I didn't realise that uh, throughout the year, that first year, she was um, finding out where I could go off and train because she liked what I was doing and got on with the kids really well and supporting the teacher and all that. And then eventually at the end of the year, she said, you're going away to Darwin. So it was there that you became the first Aboriginal teacher, first accredited Aboriginal teacher in the Northern Territory. Then eventually you became a principal here at this Catholic school in Nauyu. I'll do cultural education here and arts, do a lot of painting with the kids and then take them out on country to try and instill in them to be strong. From the beginning, you've really used art as a, a tool and a mechanism for education, haven't you? Yeah. Why has that been important? Westerners are really good at recording history, stories, you know, uh, happy stories, sad stories, stories about themselves. By writing all of that, we do it through art, song and dance. And um, that's how we record things. And that's why I, I said that maybe I could use that form in helping to educate our kids. Being a teacher, it was a new thing as well with my people and elders. They were saying, why are you in that position? And the title is that word that they use, teacher. And then I said, well, you're a teacher too. You've been teaching me and other young people about what's right and what's not right, you know? So that's all it is. So I'm here to help our kids to continue to have a better understanding with some of the things that you've been telling us, as in who we are and how we should walk our journey and uh, have better understanding of each other. And it's not just that, we've got to learn what schooling is about as well in the programs, because uh, learn to read and write and do the maths and so on, you know, the health and the religion and all that sort of thing. And then, so what are you painting for, they'd say. And I said, it's um, passing on stories to the children. 
and having a better understanding of the dream time stories that you've um, been telling us. And that, that connection between art, culture and education, that was really what, I guess, underpinned the Miriam Rose Foundation that you founded in 2013. At that point, what were you hoping to achieve with it? Sure, it was, um, uh, first of all, to support young people in the community, like their journey through life, as in education and other things, you know, family. And uh, I was hoeing and humming about it for a while, whether I should or not. And um, he, people got behind me and said, they kind of pushed me into it. No. <laughs> and said, do it, do it, we'll be here to support you, you know. You might better be. And anyway, but it was also for the fact that um, during that time, we lost seven people, young ones, through suicide. Ch children? Yeah, young people. Um, 22, 18, that sort of thing. And the last one was my nephew my sister's kid. And I said, oh no, you know, this has got to stop because they're our future. He's the baby that met Pope John Paul in Alice. He's walking up on to get on to the stage and he went straight over to my sister, Louise, and picked up the baby, my nephew, and kissed him on the forehead or head and the baby kissed him back. And um, what's so amazing about that is, and sad at the same time, because he took his life when he was about 22, through suicide. And uh, at the funeral I said, how amazing for him to be held by Pop John Paul when he was a baby, because later on, Pope John Paul was canonized as a saint. And I said, wow, he's been held by a saint. You know what I mean? Yeah, that was amazing. Mm. That, that time when those seven people died, that must have been incredibly tough for uh, the was. community. And, and for you and your family personally. How did you navigate through that? It was a sad time because those sort of things never happened in communities before. Uh, if anyone passed, it was through sickness or whatever, you know, uh, or accident on the road or whatever. With uh, having lose those young ones through suicide, it was brand new. We're still trying to, um, we're kind of still reeling about it and trying to have an understanding why all of this and uh, yeah, that sort of thing had never happened in communities before with my people. You've spoken before about walking together. I wonder how do you explain what that means to Australians, what walking together means and what? All, how all Australians can walk with First Nations people. It was always repeated by the nuns that we had to walk in two worlds and have try and get a better understanding of how Westerners live and function in their towns and cities. And um, we're saying it shouldn't be just one-way traffic, it should be that the Westerners come and learn about us as well. You know, we were able to speak their languages and understand what it's like to live in cities and towns. We've done as much as, well, I've done a lot in being able to understand Westerners. They've got to come and meet my people and understand them as well. Yeah, you've done a, a huge amount of work. In... I'll go around Australia and talk at conferences and that's how I carry on. Nah, Has... not truly. <laughs> <laughs> and it's where we get to hear your voice and I guess the voice that you've given to your life, your experience and your perspective has also seen some pretty big spotlights shone on you, including 
uh, the 2021 Australian of the Year, where you were announced as Senior Australian of the Year. Dr Miriam Rose, Ungamir Bauman. That was the first time that I got to properly sit down with you. I did the first interview with you after that award. Uh, I wonder, how does that all fit when you were looking to retire, whereas it, things, it seems to me things just keep getting busier and busier for you? It's hard, I suppose, for Westerners to understand. Westerners start thinking of retiring and giving up a lot of things that they did throughout their life journey in who they were and what they did, you know. And um, it's now time for them to have time out and spend a lot of time with their families and their children, grandkids, whatever. For us, the uh, Aboriginal people, that's when our work starts. When it comes to work, continuously working with our young people. Now that I'm a senior Australian of the year, I'm told I will have a lot more work to do. <laughs> so, Mr Morrison, our Prime Minister, help me. <laughs> what was that year like when you were named Senior Australian of the Year? <laughs> Saying what was all that about? Because <laughs> I think it was pretty busy for you, wasn't it? It was, but look, the year after that, I'll tell you, I was hardly at home. I was here, there and everywhere. Uh, walking and talking with different organisations, whether it's education, health, government. That year led you to being one of the ten everyday Australians to attend the Queen's funeral. How did you feel about that experience at the time and I guess what's it meant since? I mean, I shouldn't laugh about um, you know, going to the funeral about with, uh, for the Queen. But what I'm kind of laughing is, I'm not the only black fellow here. You know, they should ask him somebody else. There's biggest mobs of us here in Australia. Why me? Give is that me what it felt break. like? Is, no. Was it a bit like that? Why me? Yeah. But uh, I thought about it a bit and I said to my husband, Ken, I've decided after a day, uh, you know, thinking about it, and I said, I'm going. Where we are now was a mission established by the Catholic Church. In, that was in the 50s. You were baptised uh, Catholic as well. What's your view of faith and what's been its role in your life? I suppose it was the support of your family in wanting for me to be, uh, come a baptised Catholic. In that time, I think I was about 10, 12, yeah. And um, it just helped me to be, I suppose, strong in what I believed in. It's not just the Catholic ethos, but other things that you've done as a person in life and <laughs> being a, an example to others around you. And uh, because I know that <laughs> you're going to tell the young ones today, hey, behave or walk on the straight and narrow. Who are you to tell me? You're doing all this sort of thing and that thing and that whatever, you know. So you can't tell me. I'm not going to listen to you sort of thing. So you have to make sure that you're good and proper. And I suppose being a teacher helped a lot as well. What are those things growing in the water, in the billable? Water lilies. What do we call them? Mini Mindy. Mini Mindy. Yeah? Say Mini Mindy. Mini Mindy. Can you eat Mini Mindy? Yes. I've got a lot to thank the church for what they've done for me and my people in a lot of the areas. Um, 
and they were full on with us as we were growing up. But then they said that, you know, the responsibility is now in your hands, meaning to the community and my people. They don't know that first flower there. The baby one. Yeah, it'll do. And bring with that flower. We found God in nature, okay? And without us understanding nature, my people wouldn't be here right now because they had to understand the different seasons so we can go and collect taka, you know, and live. It strikes me that you balance your Catholicism with your cultural spirituality as well. Tell me about Dididi. Dididi is um, what my people, it's, it's our spirituality. And uh, I wanted to write about it. One priest pulled me up when I was younger and said, hey, do you know that your people have um, this spirituality amongst your people, um, you know, have this? And I said, no, only because I didn't know what he was talking about. And then sit down and I'll explain. And he was working very closely with an anthropologist, right, Dr. William Stanner. And he worked with um, the people around this region and some of the missionaries. And um, so he spoke to me about it and, and I got a better understanding and he said, I can sit down with you and uh, help you put what it is that I'm talking to you about. And that was the two and a half pages that uh, we've got in writing now. Um, in what that is, it's Deep listening, silent, still awareness. And it's in relation to appreciating nature. Do you think that we do that enough? We do the practice of Dididi where we stop and really deeply listen. And what do you think we could all get, gain from that? It helps your spirit to, to be fulfilled because you're being smothered by things that you do day in and day out. Do you know, um, um, when people come up and I sit, or, sit with them on country around here, um, sometimes when I say, you gotta slow down, let's go and sit by the river bank and watch the flow of the river and listen to the sounds of the bird. <laughs> Some people cry, Westerners, because they can't see themselves slowing down. And I said, that's why you're doing this, because you're <laughs> not so full of yourself, but full of busyness. Time controls you. And you get caught up in yeah. what everyone else needs. Mm -hmm. So to let go of a lot of those things. I know you've got duties to do at home and also duties to do when you're at working amongst the people around you, you know. But you gotta have some time for yourself as well. And it seems to me that when you're talking about the Didi, it's about that deep listening, deep thinking. And I guess in a sense, it's what we're all having to do this year, isn't it? When we're talking about changing our constitution and a voice to parliament. I wonder from what you're seeing, do you think we're doing enough of the listening part? No, not really, because, you know, with um, what you asked me earlier on, with what do I mean by walking together, there's not enough of it going on in uh, people uh, being able to understand us more. Sure, there are service providers that are working here in the community and you meet people eventually through your life journey 
and you find out that there are people that are wanting to know you better. There's still supposed to be more of that happening, like understanding each other better. Yeah. As I've been travelling around parts of Australia, yarning with people of all walks of life, I'm hearing all different perspectives on the voice to Parliament, some saying yes, some saying no, some maybe, some saying they don't have enough information or want to know more. Ha have you come to a position on the voice to Parliament yet? No, there's not enough information coming out to our places. To, to here, to your country? Not only here, in other communities as well, out in the remote areas. There should be more uh, talking and uh, having um, have a better understanding of what this is all about and you know, where it's going to take us. And you know yourself, there's a lot of issues in communities and towns and cities, um, not just in the territory, everywhere else. Um, with our mob, um, there's not enough being done for our people and for our young people. And, uh, and with the voice, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't know what, what they're talking about properly because there's not enough information what it's about coming out to our mob. One of uh, the important aspects of deep listening is the who, the person that we're actually listening to. What does it mean to you to be an elder? Um... I think, you, you know, with your own immediate people, family, children, um, they look up at you, you know what I mean? Um, like the ones that we had by the river today. And um, they have that um, respect and feeling that they should listen and take on board in what I've been t talking to them about. You've talked about um, passing on knowledge and, and how you feel at, at this age is where the work mm. really gets going or, or really kicks it off. It never stops, yeah. <laughs> where do you reckon you're at in your journey as an elder? I just feel that there's that respect and I've got to keep to that in saying that if I've got to pull somebody up in the street here in the community, or they want me to go sit and talk to them to calm them down, you know, if they're not feeling good in the spirit. Um, I've always said that, you know, if you want anything, if you want support, if you want taka and through the foundation, I can get the food for them or um, I can sit with them and talk to them or take them out and go fishing and sit by the river and sit and talk and take their family and have a feed of whatever they catch from within the river or by the billabong. Um, yeah. And you still continue to build because different young ones come up, you know, and still learning about the responsibility of us as elders in the community. Miriam Rose Ungamal Borman, thank you so much for joining me on One Plus One. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, I've enjoyed talking to you.